Welcome to Church at Home. We're so glad that you're joining us from wherever you are. And we just want to say that we love you. And we are so glad that we now have an opportunity to both connect online and gather together in person in our outdoor summertime Sunday night gatherings at the San Clemente Outlets at 6 p.m. every Sunday. You have an opportunity to come, bring your beach chair, bring a hat for some sun. It tends to cool down pretty quick at night, which is great. And uh, we're just having an amazing time worshiping God together right over our city. It's amazing. San Clemente Alto is just perched over the whole city of San Clemente. The sound of heaven going forward, the preaching of the gospel going forward right there at that shopping center. In fact, last week we got a direct message on Instagram from someone that said, I came to the San Clemente Outlets to shop and I ended up staying for church. Didn't know that church was happening and she got sucked into the goodness of what God's doing through us. And so make sure you come out six o'clock Sunday nights. And uh, we wanna let you know that there's opportunities to take next steps and get involved too. 
Um, we just believe that the best way to get connected into a church is by getting involved serving in and through the church. And so there's just something amazing that happens when you start rubbing shoulders with other people, setting up chairs, uh, clicking buttons uh, to make video stuff happen, or using your God-given gifts in photography, graphic design, your God-given gifts in kids ministry. Uh, we need your help with anything and everything at the church and we'd be happy to help you out. So in fact, this Wednesday night at six o'clock, we're actually having something that we call our team night. Team night is a chance for us to include brand new people that want to start serving and getting involved or just lean into a conversation of what it could look like to join a team. You don't have to commit this Wednesday night, but just come and hear the vision, experience the culture of Zion Church, get to know the leadership. We'd love to have you. It's going to be at six o'clock at Lighthouse Community Gardens, the same place that we had our first two outdoor services. And it's going to be a great time where we just build community. Uh, we do some uh, leadership development and we talk about what's to come as a surf team here at our church. Lastly, I want to step into a time of generosity. And one thing that we dreamed about Zion Church is that this would be a place and a people known by its stunning generosity. And so what we've done is we've actually started, this Sunday we're launching what we're calling our Summertime Stunning Generosity Challenge. And so are you ready for it? This is our first challenge and it's gonna last through the month of July. What we thought of is what could be a way that we really bless the small businesses in our local communities that are struggling so much financially by all the openings and the closings and the regulations. So many people I've talked to, they're saying, yeah, my business is suffering. My restaurant's hurting. I, I actually don't even know how we're gonna make it. And I just think as a church, it's one thing to just say, hey, we're praying for you. It's another thing to say, um, we're supporting you. We're fighting for you. We're investing in you and your future. And I just believe that God's called us as a church to be a people of stunning generosity. So your challenge for the rest of the month of July is simply this, is to go to a locally owned restaurant and what we're challenging our church to do, I know it's crazy, so buckle up, is whatever the total cost of your meal is, we're challenging you to tip that amount to that restaurant. <laughs> I know it's, you know, so maybe you're gonna start making more turkey sandwiches at home, but please don't do that. Let's bless, let's sow into, let's invest into people in our community that own restaurants and people that, are, that aren't a part of our church family that own restaurants. What better way to show the world that we care than by doing something kind of radical, kind of crazy, kind of stunning. And so just do that and maybe on the receipt you can just write Jesus loves you and we're fighting for you. Jesus loves you and we're standing together with you. We're, we're here for you. And uh, yeah, we would just encourage you to do that. Also, there's three ways to continue to live generously by giving in and through Zion Church. The ministry hasn't stopped. The mission hasn't stopped. Nothing has really slowed us down. In fact, we're advancing. Our, our vision, advancing the cause of Jesus here in San Clemente and beyond even more than ever right now. And so please continue to be faithful in your tithing and giving above and beyond your tithe to advance the vision and all that God wants to do in and through this church. There's three ways to give. You can give online at zionchurch.online. You can give via text 84321. You can text any amount. And then lastly, you can mail a check or cash, probably don't mail cash, but if you want to mail cash and risk it, go for it, to 555 North El Camino Real, uh, number A403. I think the address is on the screen. We're gonna give you guys 20 to 30 seconds to pray through what God would lead you to give and to respond however he leads. Thank you. Philippians 1, 27 through 30 says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I know that you are standing together, Paul says, with one spirit 
and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. And this kind of confidence is gonna actually be a sign to them that they are gonna be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We're in the struggle together, Paul says. You have seen my struggle in the past and you know that I am still in the midst of it. The message that God put on my heart this morning is titled, Together. Three times in this passage, Paul says the word together. He says that as citizens of heaven, we're called to be people who stand together, who fight together, and who struggle together. And so, if you're taking notes, write down together, or you can just say together. This is the theme. The theme is unity. I can't wait to preach to you what God's been putting on my heart this whole week, because if we do this Christian life alone, we're going to get compassion fatigue, we're going to burn out, we're going to be isolated, we're going to be lonely, we're going to struggle on our own. And the reality is, is there are struggles in life regardless, but we're meant to do it together. We need to stand together. We need to learn to fight together for the good news, not to just fight against bad news. And we are called to bear one another's burdens in this war, this spiritual battle that we're in together. The theme the entire series has been Philippians, citizens of heaven. We've been asking the question, what does it look like to live as citizens of heaven while we spend our time here on earth? And this, this passage is really the driving passage of the entire series. Paul says, above all. It's kind of crazy that he says above all. He said a lot in his letter. He said a lot up until this point, and we're still just finishing the first chapter of this book. He says a lot afterwards in the next few chapters, and yet he says, above all, we must live as citizens of heaven. So what does it look like to live as citizens of heaven here on earth? Paul in this passage goes on and he says it looks like unity. It looks like the prayer that Jesus prayed, his last prayer, was that his disciples, his followers would be one, they would be unified. And I just believe Jesus' last prayer should be our first desire to be unified. Paul wants us to be unified in the church for the world. I want to say that again, it's so important that we would be unified in the church first. And the end goal is for the world. It's a witness to the world. Jesus said that the world would know who we truly are by the way that we love one another. And so that's what unity is all about. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the thing that's on Paul's mind. Unity in the church for the purpose of attracting the world to how amazing the news is that Jesus Christ came, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, gave us the free gift of salvation, raised back from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father to pull us into the best news ever, that you have the free gift of eternal life in Him. And it begins now, and you get to spread it to everyone around you. That's what we need to be unified over as a church. And the end goal is that the world would be compelled. The world would be attracted to what this life looks like. So what does it look like to be good news? I want to talk to you about two things this morning that Paul really uh, hones in on in this passage. It looks like a people that stand together, number one. And then secondly, it looks like a people that fight together. But sadly, oftentimes what we see in the church today, if we're really honest, uh, sounds a lot like the scenario, the scene uh, in Ezekiel chapter 37 when God took the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Uh, he took him to a valley with dry bones and, and it, it, it was a vision that God took him into. And in this passage, he, he puts this scene before Ezekiel and I want to read it for you. It's, it's, it's so indicative of oftentimes what we see and what we feel in the church today. Verse 1, it says that the Lord took hold of me. Ezekiel says, I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley 
A valley, by the way, is a place for dead things. A valley, when you think about it in, in, in all the contexts of Scripture, was a place of fear. It was a place of, of where, where you would toss dead things. You would discard things. The Spirit of the Lord took me to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. And check this out. They were scattered everywhere. They were divided. Everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. They were dry. And then he asked me, son of man, and this is, I think, what God's asking us when he looks at the church today. He says, can these bones become alive again? Can these bones become living people again? Can these bones become what I dreamed and intended they to be again? And I like the honesty of the prophet Ezekiel because it's like, he's just like us. You, sometimes we think these heroic characters in the Bible like were omniscient, they knew everything and they were totally confident all the time. Ezekiel's like, um, oh sovereign Lord, uh, uh, I don't know. You alone are the one that know the answer to that. I want you to focus on this situation though because I think it so parallels where we find ourselves in so much of the church life today. These bones, they were divided. They were scattered, they were divided. They were dry and then they were dead. First, they were divided. And because they were divided, they were completely dried out. They were divided from the body. So they were laying across the floor completely dead, completely dried out. And then it, it takes you into this like final state. They were dead. And God says, can they come back to life? But the first thing that led to the dead thing was division. They were scattered. And there's nothing worse for our lives personally, in our family, in our friendship circles, in our businesses at work with our coworkers, in churches locally, in our global church. There's nothing that will destroy our lives, our families, our marriages, our friendships, our church more than the weapon of disunity. You think about it, you know, when you uh, watch a National uh, Ge uh, Geographic show or something like that where there's a predator kind of animal. What does the predator animal do? It looks at a herd and it tries to isolate one of the animals from the herd because that predator knows that if they can isolate an animal from the herd, they can destroy it. And that's the exact thing that the enemy wants to do. He wants to isolate you. He wants to keep you from community. He, he doesn't want you to watch this. He doesn't want you to show up on Sunday nights. He doesn't want you to join a life group. He doesn't want you to be a part of a family, a community. He doesn't want you to lean into tough conversations with people. He wants you to stay distant, disconnected, and removed. Because if you stay isolated, if you stay distant from other people, then you can stay in a place of bitterness. You can be a victim and you can say, you know what, that whole church thing, that God thing, there, was, there wasn't really anything there anyways. It wasn't really all it was cracked up to be. The enemy isolates us to destroy us. And what causes disunity? What are the common causes of disunity? It can be simple misunderstandings that, that create massive footholds of bitterness in our lives where maybe you have something against a family member that has really been a wound and a hang up in your life for years that you've been struggling with, but it all started with something so little. But that seed of, of misunderstanding or miscommunication or missed expectations has now grown into this massive thing that's just robbed you of a beautiful, healthy family kind of relationship. Maybe it's an offense. Someone has offended you and you can't get over that offense. Maybe it's just jealousy and you, you can't get over the way that it seems like everything works out for that other person. And you look at your own life and you compare and you're like, man, I just, there, there's no way that I can be friends with them because their life is so much better than mine. Maybe it's this gossip that oftentimes happens in church life where we talk about other people behind their back and then we come to church and, hey, oh, I love you. And yet we hold hatred in our heart for that person. Maybe it's tunnel visioned opinions where you see stuff on the news and, and stuff is happening in our country and there's political opinions and there's social media um, discussions, should I say arguments, and all you can see is your opinion. 
You have blinders on. And it's about being right instead of being loving. Maybe it's just judging others on social media or, or judging people that wear masks or don't wear masks or, or, you know, like we have endless opportunities to judge other people right now and we don't even know their story. Maybe it's selfish ambition where you want to you wanna go somewhere and other people are slowing you down. I'm telling you, disunity is so destructive because look, it can take shape in so many different ways. It's one of the go-to weapons that the enemy uses to slow down, disconnect, and destroy Jesus' church. And think about it, disunity really just comes down to selfishness. It's as simple as that. You know, we, we all really have it inside of us if we're super honest. You know, you, you see it in a two-year-old. We, we kind of have it when we come out of the womb, right? A two-year-old isn't naturally selfless. Two-year-old isn't naturally generous. A two-year-old isn't naturally patient. <laughs> it's about mine. It's about what I want. It's about, I don't care about your sleep. It's about what I want, when I want it, how I want it. And it's our default, but it, it has to be rooted out of our lives personally, in our marriages, in our businesses. I'm telling you, God wants to bring the kingdom of heaven, citizens of heaven here on earth. And it comes in the form of unity. Jesus' final prayer, I talked about it in John 17, verse 23. He says, may they, he's talking about us in the future. May all who follow me, may they be brought to complete unity. And why? Why does Jesus want us to be unified as a church? Is, is it just to kind of have a holy huddle? Is it just to have some friends that get us? No, he says, may they, may the church be brought into complete unity to let the world know that you sent me. It validates the beauty of Jesus and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus' final prayer has got to be our first desire as a church, that we would be one living in unity. Why do we need to be unified? To represent Jesus to the world. To represent, to represent Jesus to the world. See, the message of Jesus never changes, but methods always do. And there's new criticisms and, and new things that, that the world looks at when they see the church and go, you know, I, I don't know if I want to be a part of that. I don't know. It, it, it feels like they, they care more about being right. It feels like they're exclusive. It feels like they, they just want to be about one thing and can't listen to other people. And, and, and if I don't agree with them, I can't be with them. If I don't believe like them, I don't belong. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Your unity actually shouldn't make your group more exclusive. It should make it more inclusive and attractive to the world. Is the world attracted to the church or is the world disgusted by the church? Let's be honest. And this, this unity thing is the thing that will answer that question. So why do we need to be unified? Well, number one, because we're family. We're family. Uh, I, I saw I saw something online that I thought was so indicative of where we are as a culture. You know, they've even said with social media that we're more connected than ever, yet more disconnected than ever. And it's crazy how technology can make you connected and yet still feel so lonely. Um, there's an article online that said that there's a dream bridesmaid for hire. Her name's Jen. Jen Glantz is there for women on the biggest day of their lives for about $2,000 per wedding. The 31-year-old entrepreneur has been a professional bridesmaid since 2015, working dozens of ceremonies each year around the country. She's a, she, she acts as a dear friend for the day. She's not a wedding planner, um, and so she's not there to pick your flowers and, and, and taste cake, but she shows up the day of, and she shows up in her job is to energize the dance floor get the party going. She, she is paid to distract problem relatives so that the bride doesn't have to deal with it. <laughs> and above all, she's there to stand with the bride, comforting her on her most special day. 
And so she said that all day you're running and you're putting fires out. She said she's clocked 30,000 steps in one wedding because um, clients have really broken, messy family situations or they don't have any close friends. So she's a quick fill-in. Um, but it's crazy. She launched her company in 2015 and she has done it now for dozens and dozens and dozens of people all around the country and now she's actually hired on professional bridesmaids on her team to do exactly what she does to fill in to be the maid of honor and bridesmaids for people that don't have one and and and, and here's the thing they, and I just want to say lastly she says she says uh, that she rejects any applicants that want to be on her professional bridesmaid team who emphasize how much they just love to party <laughs> and so she has a little litmus test but she says about the job it's not a party it's an emotional roller coaster and I think that's a great description of how many of our lives really are I know it's really sad when you think about it that there would be a bride standing up there on the biggest day of her life and wouldn't have anyone to stand next to her is th this isn't just about loneliness no though no, th this is about disunity like what is it where all the family relationships are severed what is it about family relationships being severed and friendships being severed through the years that we wouldn't be able to have someone to stand next to us loneliness disunity discord disagreement is a cultural epidemic right now. How sad is that? That's why when Paul says this, it's so important for us as a church. He says, whether I come and see you again or only to hear about you as a church, I wanna know that first of all, you're standing together with one spirit and one purpose. Jesus' dream was a church. I want you to hear that. He went to the cross for a church, to birth a church. A lot of times we individualize and we privatize salvation and we just think salvation is about getting me to heaven. No, no, no. Salvation is about getting heaven into a church, a movement that would pull down the realities of heaven and activate it here and now. Jesus didn't just die for you. Jesus didn't just die for me. Jesus died to birth a church. And we gotta get out of this me-centered religion. It's a we-centered faith. And when we think about this, the church is a family. You know, the people of Israel were called the people of God and it was always seen as a father that was leading and guiding a family. The church is called to be a family of God. That's why back in the day I loved it because people used to call one another brothers and sisters. Because the spiritual family is actually even a deeper connection than even our earthly families. But is that the reality today? Being so unified? Man, my family, we were far from perfect. If you ask my sisters, far from perfect. We had our disagreements, we had our fights, we had craziness like all of our families. But one thing I will say about my family, no matter what, at the end of the day, we hugged it out. We hugged it out because we were family no matter what. And that's why I love, I love that punishment. That's like my favorite punishment that parents do for children is when they force siblings to hug it out for like an awkward extended period of time. And you just see those like pain faces when they have to embrace that sibling that they don't want to hug in that moment. But it's a beautiful thing because what, it, what that image does for us is it, it says that proximity is the only thing that can cultivate true love. See, distance creates division. Proximity cultivates love. In Ezekiel chapter 37, what was the first thing that I mentioned about the bones? The bones, they ended up being dead because first they were scattered, they were divided. Jesus said, in the end times, now, I don't know exactly when the end times are, but man, crazy stuff is happening in our world. And we just need to be prepared for Jesus to come back. But what he says is that in the end times, one of the signs of the times is that the love of many will grow cold for one another. Think about that. We'll distance each other with Facebook or Instagram arguments. 
where we can hide behind digital comments. We'll distance ourselves from other people that have cut us and we'll just cut them off. We'll distance ourselves from people that don't look like us, don't have the same skin color or socioeconomic status or background. We're gonna distance ourselves from people from different political persuasions on the other side of the aisle, not listen, not lean into where they're coming from. We'll distance ourselves in where we live and where we eat and where we shop and where we go to the beach and hang out. Distance is the first thing that creates division, which ends up drying out our lives, callousing our hearts, and killing us on the inside. It's proximity, it's getting close, that cultivates a genuine love. We're one body, one people, one family, in the family of God, and we have so much more in common than we do that's different. We share way more than what tries to split us apart. And let me just say this, if this sounds like, hey, just one world, you know, one peace, one love, if this sounds like a Bob Marley song, it's not. Because in the way of Jesus, unity is not uniformity. Uniformity is sameness. Uniformity says, I don't even see color. What? <laughs> We're made unique in the image of God, but we're made unique and dynamic and different. No. It's about celebrating our uniqueness and our diversity. Unity is not uniformity. Uniformity, you know, uniform comes from the same root word as uniformity. It's just the same thing you hand out to everybody. No, unity says, man, I see those differences and I wanna learn about you. Because when I learn about you and I listen to your story, that allows me to love you. Uniformity isn't what God has called us to. In heaven, what does it say it's gonna look like? Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, all worshiping one God. There's one goal, there's one purpose, and that's giving God glory and honor. And by the way, we're gonna be one big happy family. And so if you don't like other people in the church right now, maybe even our church, if, if, you, if you try to steer clear from someone when you come to Zion Church, um, I just wanna let you know, like you're gonna be seeing them again in heaven for all of eternity. There's no time clock to it. And, and you know, if we can't get along now, then, then what's heaven gonna be like? We're gonna be hanging out together for all of eternity. Let's start practicing tough love now. So this is what Paul calls us to, unity. Not uniformity, but unity. Harmony, harmony happens when you have, like harmony comes from the, the word uh, about like maybe an orchestra or a band that has different instruments that are all playing at the same time. And there's one common goal and objective and they're all playing different instruments, different tunes, but when it coalesces and comes together at the same time, it creates a beautiful sound. But here's the thing, one instrument that's off key can ruin the entire song. One person. And that's how serious disunity is. It is a cancer in the church. It's a cancer in your marriage. It's a cancer at your business. It's a cancer in our families. And so here's, here's the question. The world's listening to the church. What sound are they hearing? What sound do they really hear? So as we look at it, we're a family. And our love for one another truly is our witness to the world, as Jesus says. And I love what St. Francis Assisi says about this. As the world looks at us, let's just carry this, this quote. I love this quote. He said, preach the gospel always, and when necessary, use words. See, witnessing to the world isn't just about talking. It's not just about our words. The world is listening to our lives. Preach the gospel always by the way that you live, by the way that you lean into relationship with other people and when necessary, use words. We need each other. I know American self-reliance tells us you don't need people. Just hustle, 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 grind, grind, grind. You do you. 
No, no, the Bible says, and what Christianity, this movement, this tribe, this, this people is all about is saying, no, I actually need you because you have something that I need. That's what encouragement means. Encouragement means to put courage in someone else. I need your courage today. I need that text. I need your hope. I need your joy. I need you to spread the Jesus stuff that you have all over me because I might be having a low day and you might need what I have tomorrow. This is what it's all about. It's, it's a beautiful thing when you think about the redwood trees in Northern California, the sequoias, Yosemite, Big Sur, all these massive, huge trees that have been alive for hundreds of years. And the really interesting thing about these massive, iconic redwood trees is they actually don't have the deepest roots, but they have the widest. And so instead of just, just going deep on their own, what they do, these roots, they spread out wide and they grab a hold of one another. So that way, when the fiercest of winds comes down the valley, when the storm rages, they have roots that hold on to one another through thick and thin. And that's what Paul says. He's like, stand together, first of all. Learn to stand together because life is going to be challenging and you can't do it on your own. And that's what the church is here for. Stand together. Secondly, Paul says, fight together. So we need unity, first of all, because we're a family. And we're not a perfect family, but we are a real family. And we gotta lean in and grab a hold of one another through tough times and celebrate the best of times together. You belong in God's family. And then secondly, we need to be unified because we're an army. Paul says, stand together for one spirit and one purpose is what unites us. And then fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. He says, when we fight for the good news, we don't have to be intimidated. We don't have to be afraid of any of our spiritual enemies, any of the forces at work that are trying to give us a sense of insecurity, a sense of worthlessness, a sense of anxiety and depression. No, no, you're gonna fight together with other people and because of this mutual support, this team effort, moving forward, advancing the gospel, we're not going to have to be afraid of the enemies that come against us. And this is actually going to be a sign that they will be destroyed. But you're going to be saved, even by God himself. And you haven't just been given the privilege of trusting Jesus in the good times. Paul says, you've also been given the privilege. What? Yeah, yeah. The privilege of suffering for him. Suffering? A privilege? Yeah. Suffering, struggling, fighting is a privilege when it comes to your life in Christ. He says, we're in this together. And you've seen my struggle. You've seen the war that I've been fighting. You've seen the battles that I've been stepping into. And you know I'm still with you. I'm still with you in the midst of it. And I want you just to hear this. This might be new for you, but we're in a war. When you were born again as a believer, you were born into a spiritual battle. You have to recognize that the Bible isn't written to civilians. It's written to soldiers. There's no bench on this team. There's no armchair quarterbacks. You were drafted. You were put in the game. The church, you know, is, is meant to be something so much more than a social club or an institution. It's a movement, Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm gonna build my church. And what? The gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. The last time I checked, gates weren't offensive weapons. They were defensive measures. What Jesus is giving us is a picture. He says the church is going to be an offensive movement advancing the kingdom of God into every dark place, every broken place, every hurting and hopeless situation, advancing the life-giving reality that the kingdom has come. And so you've been drafted into an army that's advancing. Paul says, don't just stand together, but fight together for the good news. It's really important that we recognize Paul's language is important. Paul says, fight for something, not against something. See, God will take care of the against stuff. Scripture says your battle 
isn't against flesh and blood, it's against spiritual rulers, principalities in dark places. God is fighting a battle for you on your behalf. And so oftentimes the church is known for what it's fighting against, but we're not told to be, be people fighting just against something. We're supposed to be fighting for something. I don't want to be known as a church that fights against stuff. I want to be known for what we're fighting for. It's not enough to be against racism. It's not enough to say, yeah, I'm not a racist. Okay, cool. <laughs> Are you for reconciliation? Are you for being an ambassador of love, listening and leaning in to stories of other people? Right? It's not enough to be against abortion. How are you helping to promote life? It's not, it's not enough to be against um, sex trafficking, which, which we've all been hearing about. What are you doing, though, to be for the solution? I'm not saying we all have to be in every cause in every kind of way, but, but it's, I just want to break a paradigm. It's not enough to just say, oh, yeah, that's wrong. Jesus didn't die to give you an opinion. Jesus died, rose again, put his spirit in you to make you a warrior, advancing his cause here on earth, fighting for something, caring for something, struggling for something. It's so important that we realize that it's actually a privilege to fight. Like there's no draft dodgers in the kingdom of God. You've been enlisted, you've been drafted, and I'm telling you, if you're, if you're wondering why am I bored in life? And why do I feel dry? Why does, why does it feel dead? Like, I just kind of feel blah, I feel dead. Could it be that you've actually taken yourself out of the fight? When you're in the heat of the battle, that's actually when you're most alive. I know, you think comfort is the thing that makes you feel most alive. It's actually the struggle. It's the fight. It's going after something bigger than you in your marriage. It's going after something bigger than you and your family. It's not just about building a family here on earth. <laughs> it's about you taking your family, turning them around and saying, look at the people around us that are hopeless and hurting and desperate for the life of Jesus. This is what our marriage, this is what our family, this is what our business is meant to be about. We're in the fight together. It's amazing what being a dad does, man. Uh, just having Ezekiel in my life, our little foster son for two months has really, brought up. It's kind of stirred up some stuff in me that I didn't know I had in me. I was so like chill and relaxed before. It's so crazy what being a dad does. You know, uh, I'm driving. He's back in the little car seat. He's six months old. He's, he's reversed in the car seat. I can't see him, but I just want to peek my head back there. And, and I'm driving and then a car like veers out from an alley and starts to go in front of me. And man, I, I something wells up in me. I look at that person and I go, man, I will cut you. <laughs> You know, you know, it, it, it's, it's crazy. I, you know, I was riding my electric bike and we, I put them on the ergo in front of me and uh, I just cuddle them all up, make them safe. Some of you guys are judging me right now, you know. I don't really care. He's, he's safe in my arms and I, I'm going slow. I'm watching everything around me, but I, I have him on the bike and we're riding and, and, you know, someone starts going out in front of me, not seeing the bike and I go, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> This like courage, this boldness, this like righteous indignation comes over me being a dad. Like I never knew I had it in me, but it's because I am fighting for this little, innocent, precious life. And it's so much bigger than myself. And I'm, I'm willing to be bold. I'm willing to fight for him no matter the consequence. And he's worth fighting for. What's bigger than you in your life that's worth fighting for? Have, have we made life so much about us that we don't fight for anything bigger than us? I'm telling you, if, if you're wondering what the secret sauce is in your marriage to bring the spark back, it's not another Nicholas Sparks movie. I know that was corny. It just came to my mind. It's actually fighting for something bigger than your own marriage. See. Happiness is a byproduct of a healthy marriage that has mission and cause to it. Beyond itself, it's not the reason for it. Fight for something in your family. Fight for your business. 
Fight for your children. Fight for their future. Fight for your neighbors that you see every single day. Fight for the oppressed. Fight for the unseen. Fight for the hurting. Fight for something. To fight the good fight, two things I want to leave you with as we close. To fight this good fight in unity together, the number one thing that we need is the Holy Spirit. Paul says that I want you to stand together with one spirit and one purpose. See, the problem right now, in my, in my opinion, with so many things that are happening is we actually are experiencing compassion fatigue, if we're really honest. We look at the news and we see the global pandemic and we see the racial division and then another thing happens that we're supposed to care about and then we read another article on social media and, and, and it's hard to care about everything the same and so it feels really overwhelming, we end up giving up. That's compassion fatigue. We don't care about anything in the end. Yeah, we fake it for a little while, but then it kind of leaves. And oftentimes causes, social justice endeavors can be trendy. They can be a fad. We get real confident in it, real bold, real boisterous, post about it, talk about it, march about it. But then once the fad, once the noise kind of goes down, you never hear about it again. Here's the thing. The reason why those sorts of things will never give us sustainable lasting change is because it's not built around true unity that Paul's talking about here. True unity can never be about a cause. True unity can only come from the Spirit of Christ in us. That's the only thing that can bring everyone around the table and say, let's continue to move forward. Because here's the thing. We're going to have fatigue, we're going to burn out, we're going to care about one thing for a while, we're going to go in one direction for a little bit, we're going to care about different things and have way too many differences that will want to divide us and those causes will never get accomplished because we focus on the problems and we focus on the strategy and we focus on solutions when we need to start with the Spirit. We start with the Holy Spirit as our unifier. We say, fill us, give us your eyes, give us your ears, give us your heart, give us your actions and that will lead to the strategies. And so the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us fight the good fight together. He has to be our great unifier. You will burn out without the Holy Spirit. You will get dry, you will get callous, you will get distant without a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. And so we're not called just to do work for God, we're called to allow God to do His work in us. And then the right actions, the right motivations, the right intentions come out of that. And this is how the early church saw the explosive, beautiful, genuine growth of, of Jesus in their time. They, they didn't have much, but they had the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit filled them and gave them the kind of crazy compassion, gave them the kind of stunning generosity, gave them the kind of love for other people that were so unlike them that they didn't have before. One spirit and one purpose. You need his help. That's why the Holy Spirit is called your helper, to help you do what only God can do through you. And then secondly, we not only need the Holy Spirit, we need holy habits. See, this word holy simply means set apart. And in, in order to see different things come out of our lives, in order to see a different kind of church that's, that's really the, the kind of church that Jesus dreamed it to be fully unified, we are one spirit, we're one mind, we're of one purpose, we have one mission, making him famous, not us famous. And in order to see that, to see different, we gotta be willing to do different. See, a lot of times messages like this can be aspirational, they can be inspirational, they can be motivational, and go, oh yeah, yeah, unity, yeah, love, yeah, yeah, let's fight the good fight, and then we leave it there without any practical. The reality is, is if you never do different, you'll never see different in your life. You know, your future is really just defined by a series of little habits that you form over time. Holy habits, holy means set apart. The church needs to look different. The church should be something that the world looks at and be like, be like, man, I don't understand why they do that, but I want in. 
I'm attracted to that. Think about the early church. It was literally persecuted. It was, and a lot of times we think, oh man, we're being, I've heard, I've just, I've heard lately that the American church is being persecuted. Man, we're being persecuted. We're being, like, like, we can't gather. Now we're told we can't sing. Are you kidding me? Go outside. <laughs> we're not being persecuted. Sure, it's inconvenient, but we're still a movement. We're not a building. And we're going to worship God wherever we find ourselves. But think about it. The persecution of, of like the underground church of China actually has led to ex its explosion and growth. And the early church was persecuted. The early church, people were stoned. People were beaten. They were whipped. And the early church, they had this crazy simplicity. And yet there was a, a passionate worship that they had for this invisible God. There was this crazy uh, generosity that they had when they came together. Acts chapter 2 says they shared everything that they had. There was this, this beautiful unity that they had. And, you know, Paul is in prison. People are being stoned and sawed in two, literally. And people are being beheaded, stoned, sawed in two. Paul is rotting in prison and the world goes, sign me up. I want in on that. That's what crazy unity can do. It actually is our witness to the world. It's not just comfort. It's not success. It's not fame. It's not ease. It's in the midst of the struggle when they see people that won't give up on each other, people that will stand together, people that will lean in and listen, people that will fight for the good news, fight for every single person to know that they are loved, that they're accepted, that they're forgiven, that they're set free, that they have a future, that they're gonna make a difference, that there's a purpose for their lives. It's that kind of church that the world can't turn and say, wow, I want in on that. Where do I sign up? That's what true unity can do. It can actually create a brand new future. We need Holy Spirit to guide us. We need holy habits to change us. And then lastly, I wanna take you to uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, because I think this gives us a great image as we think about what could be takes them to the valley of dry bones and they're divided. They're dry and they're dead. But in verse 4, God says to the prophet Ezekiel, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I'm going to put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I'm going to put breath into you and you're going to come to life and you're going to know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel said that he spoke this message just as God told him. And suddenly as he spoke, there was a rattling noise. <laughs> Can you imagine it? All across the valley, the bones of each body came together, attached themselves as complete skeletons. And then as he watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones, then skin formed to cover the bodies, but they still had no breath in them. They were together but they didn't have the breath, so they weren't alive. Then in verse nine, God says to Ezekiel, speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic, a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke a message as he commanded me, and the breath came into their bodies. And check this out, three things happened. They all came to life, they stood up on their feet together, and it was a great army. I want you to imagine right now, there's a rattling noise happening all over South County right now. Because you're watching this and the Holy Spirit is speaking through me to you right now. What he's doing is he's bringing dry bones, he's bringing dead dreams, he's bringing dis 
unified families and marriages and businesses back together right now. And he's saying, I want to breathe my life into you. I know that you're hurting. I know you feel hopeless, but I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put a new spirit in you. And I'm going to put a family, a community, a tribe around you that you get to lean into. You get to struggle with and you get to celebrate with. And you're going to advance the kingdom of God in this season of struggle in a way that you could never do in a season of success. Together, we win. Divided, we fall. That's it. Together, we advance the kingdom of God and see breakthrough and beauty all over our lives and in our cities. Disunified we fall apart. What will we choose? Imagine what your life could look like. Imagine what our church, our city, our small businesses that are struggling right now, what could it look like if we just simply went back to the early church and said, how did they passionately love God and relentlessly love other people? And maybe that's your prayer this week. What does it look like for you to level up and say, God, I am all in, I am all yours, I am I'm in your family, show me what to do. And then you get out of your house safely, however you feel led, and you live out that love in a fearless kind of way. Take a step of faith, take a risk this week, put something in front of you as a challenge. And God can do through you something man, so much more powerful as you combine your life with the family of God, a community, than he could ever do on your own. And so let me pray for you. Let me pray for us as a church too. God, I thank you. I think this is such a timely message for us as a, as a people. There are so many obstacles to unity, so many causes for division, so many different opinions. And yet we know it's just a, a, a distraction. A distraction from our ability to stand together and fight together, advancing your cause. And so God, just take away the fluff, take away the stuff that doesn't really matter, take away the things that divide us and open up our heart, peel the layers of our heart open to you. Do a work, do heart surgery in us so that we can truly be the church that you dreamed of Jesus, that we would be one so that the church would see who you are. We want to represent Jesus to the world right now. And so God, give us your creativity, give us your innovation, and most of all, make it simple, make it clear. Put someone in our path, maybe today, right after we watch this, that we can just love like you want us to love them, filled with your Holy Spirit, filled with humility, willing to love willing to go the extra mile. God, we praise you. We thank you for these moments that we've shared. We believe that you're going to do so much through this church and all the churches in our area in this season that seems so tough, yet you're working something so powerful and good out of it. We praise you in advance. In your name, amen. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I'll raise a hallelujah Out of the unbelief I'll raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I'll raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me
going to declare that this morning. I'll raise a hallelujah in the middle of a mystery. I'll raise a hallelujah. And I will watch the darkness flee. I'll raise a hallelujah.
At the song come forth At the song arise this morning So we raise our worship We raise our praises We give thanksgiving Yeah, come on, let that be our banner this morning Let that be our song, God In every season, every storm In the highs and the lows, God, our praise Our worship is our melody Our worship is our weapon this morning Whoa. Yeah, just let the song arise from your heart. Just right there in your home with your kids around. Just begin to tell them who he is. Tell them what he's done. Tell them what he means to you. 